If I asked you to think of the most powerful weapon, your answer would probably be the nuclear bomb. While a nuclear bomb is remarkably powerful, powerful enough to level a city and force a country to surrender the largest war ever fought, the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 are nowhere even close to the most powerful weapons ever created. After World War II ended, the United Nations was formed. A resolution was brought to fruition attempting to ban atomic weapons. But because President Truman did not trust that other nations would halt development, the resolution was never passed. Many other attempts to curb the development of more nuclear arms were made during the Cold War, but very few were successful due to the lack of trust between the USSR and the USA. This led to the largest period of technological advancement ever seen. Unfortunately, most of these technological breakthroughs were in an effort for either the Soviets or the Americans to outdo one another. The nuclear arms race really begins in World War II with the Manhattan Project. After the US detonates its first atomic bomb, Stalin is unsurprised. He had spies deep within the Manhattan Project feeding him valuable information. The revelation that this was happening led to some controversial decisions within the United States government. By 1945 and the end of World War II, the United States was far ahead of every other nation in the world with nuclear weapons. They had successfully built and detonated three bombs and ended a war with them. Most experts had calculated that it would not be until 1952 before the Soviets would be able to construct their first real atomic bomb. However, in 1949, the Soviets shocked the world when they detonated their first atomic bomb, codenamed First Lightning. First Lightning was basically a copy of Fat Man, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki. Because Soviet success came three years before it was anticipated, fear swept the US. Many United States officials blamed the leaked information during the Manhattan Project as the entire reason the Soviets were even able to develop the bomb so quickly. Nonetheless, in January of 1950, Truman ordered for a study to be conducted across the United States on our defense systems. From this study came the National Security Council report, NSC-68. This top secret report called for the buildup of the United States military to stay ahead of the Soviets, bringing the military budget to a whopping $13 billion. This budget increase and the newfound drive for advanced weaponry led President Truman to order the development of a new kind of bomb, a hydrogen bomb. The hydrogen bomb was supposed to be a thousand times more powerful than an atomic bomb. This immense power led to fears of radiation from many within the scientific community. None other than the father of the atomic bomb himself, Robert Oppenheimer, led a group that opposed the project. Oppenheimer's efforts proved futile when in 1952, the United States detonated the first ever hydrogen bomb. Codenamed Ivy Mike, the bomb painted a lasting image into the minds of anyone that saw it go off. The mushroom cloud colored the sky purple, gray, and yellow with its 100 mile wide and 25 mile high mushroom cloud. Ivy Mike yielded a massive 10.4 megatons or the equivalent of 10.4 million tons of TNT. To put that into perspective, Fat Man yielded 21 kilotons and that bomb basically flattened Nagasaki. This bomb was a real show of power for the United States. Not to be outdone, the Soviets had their first successful hydrogen bomb test in 1953. However, this bomb was not a true hydrogen bomb. That would not come until November of 1955 when the Soviets test a 1.6 megaton weapon. Even before the Soviets test their first true hydrogen bomb, in 1954, the United States sets off the largest hydrogen bomb ever created up until that point. It was thought that the blast would only yield 5 megatons, but it wound up yielding a massive 14.8. The blast was so powerful that 28 Japanese fishermen were killed from over 80 miles away from radioactive poisoning. This incident made a lot of citizens worry about nuclear fallout. Fear and intimidation only got worse when in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik into orbit. Sputnik was launched using ICBM technology, and the threat of a long-range nuclear missile strike became very real. The launch of Sputnik prompted a rocket fever, causing the US to found NASA and increase spending for missile development. By the end of the 50s, the first intercontinental ballistic missiles were being tested. While the United States was working to improve on ICBM technology, the Russians had been working on another project. Known today as the Tsar Bomba, the Russians constructed a 60,000 pound, 26 foot long, 7 foot diameter superweapon. The bomb was so large that the bomber plane had to be modified to fit it, and a massive parachute had to be fixed to the weapon so when dropped, the plane had enough time to reach a safe distance. The Tsar bomber was designed to yield an unfathomable 100 megatons, but the Soviets knew such an explosion would cause too much damage. 
so the Soviets dampened the might of the bomb to a mere 50 megatons. When dropped on October 30th of 1961, the Tsar Bomba yielded an insane 58 megatons, making it the largest thermonuclear weapon ever created and detonated to this day. Its mushroom cloud reached 40 miles high, and the shockwave produced by the explosion was so powerful, it was able to be detected by seismic sensors even after its third revolution around the globe. Such a bomb was completely impractical and was more to intimidate the U.S. Following the Tsar bomb, more people became to fear nuclear war and the effects of nuclear fallout. More attempts had been made to diplomatically solve the nuclear problem, but the issue was that both nations thought they were the moral superior. They feared that if they made a compromise, the other side would cheat them out. This led Defense Secretary Robert McNamara to come up with the Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD. The idea was that if either side attempted to obliterate the other, the other side would launch a nuclear attack to ensure that both nations were destroyed. This policy was mostly effective at keeping the Soviets and the U.S. from starting another war. The U.S. had managed to stay ahead of the Soviets for much of the early Cold War, but by the late 60s, the Soviets had caught up. Through the 1960s and 70s, the U.S. and the Soviets continued to develop more and more weapons. At one point, the nuclear stockpile was large enough to destroy all of human life on Earth 690 times over. 